Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Bowhunter Dive. Finally getting near the end of the summer to where the big bucks are finally starting to grow out and look good. And I guess that brings up the question for our YouTube fans, Justin. And you know, we were talking about this kind of before we started this episode. We were both struggling a little bit with naming our deer right now. I mean, I actually yeah. did an interview, and I'm a little kind of bored. I'm, I actually cranked myself that I didn't have it to you guys in time, but I named the, my deer like the most stupidest names that I literally didn't turn my footage in. <laughs> I'm just so being the, honest. So the question for you guys is, end of summer's here, bucks are grown, hit lists are beginning to form. Are you still naming your deer? And if so, are you willing to share the names of your deer with us down below? Guys, make sure you leave your comments. As always, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and thanks for watching. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Bowhunter Die. You know, Justin, before we dive into this episode, we just got done filming the YouTube little intro there, and I guess I wanted to kind of carry this theme on because both of us have been struggling a little bit with coming up with future names of the deer that we're chasing. I, I was doing an interview the other day, and I mean, literally, it was so awful. I was trying to name <laughs> these deer on the fly. I should have been more creative when I was driving to the property, that you know, and and I was like, I mean, come on, sneaky. I, I mean, it's like, it's this, the this worst. It's a pretty bad deer <laughs> name. It's a pretty, pretty bad I'm name. I'm going to go back. For me, Justin, I'm going to go back to doing what I did with Longhorn. We posted a few years ago a couple bucks that I was chasing. And we allowed other people to name them. I actually really enjoyed that. So we're going to go ahead and post some photos on Facebook of a couple of bucks that I'm chasing. Guys, I need your help because I suck. Sneaky is not going to work. It's just, it's just lame. I got to redo that footage. So... Looking on Facebook, we're going to make a post of a couple bucks that I'm chasing, maybe a couple deer that Justin's chasing. We need help naming these deer. Fair it enough. is what it is. I don't have a lot of deer worth naming quite yet. I know there's a few out there. There's been sightings and reported seeing of them. I just don't have pictures yet, so no names from me for any new bucks for this year. But guys, uh, to start this episode off, first we're going to check in with Tyler Barron down in Texas. He's going to kind of wrap up or finish the segment that he started making a European mount uh, of his buck that he shot last year. So let's check in with Tyler now. Hey guys, I am back in my garage and I'm working on my Euro mount that I started a couple of weeks ago with the uh, power washing and whitening process. Uh, what I'm actually working on today is, is the pedestal mount that I'm going to make for this particular Euro and I hope it turns out pretty good. Uh, this is the first time I've ever tried to do something like this with a Euro. Normally I, I opt for sort of the traditional hang it up on the wall uh, type of scenario, but on this one I've got a spot up on top of a bookshelf in my office that I think uh, would look really sharp with a cool kind of pedestal uh, mount and a Euro up on top of it. So that's what I'm working on and hopefully it'll give you a couple of ideas if you've got one in a similar situation that you, you're looking for creative ways to kind of show off your your mount and uh, um, I just want to reiterate that I am not a taxidermist so if you're watching this and you are a taxidermist you probably have a lot better ways of doing this uh, but for a, you know you guys that are out there trying to do it yourself or uh, saving a little bit of money like I'm doing uh, maybe this will give you a couple of ideas or some inspiration to do one with of your own so uh, we'll see how it goes I'll let you guys follow along as I build this thing and uh, hopefully it turns out pretty good all right guys first I built a small base for my mount using a 1x10 with a 1x4 face and 1x2 sides. Next, I drilled a couple of holes into the base, which I'll use to put dowel rods that will support a piece of fence post that has been weathered on my lease for the last few years. Next up, I measured the distance between those holes and drilled matching holes into the piece of fence post, and I can now use the two dowel rods to suspend the fence post above the base board. Next, I use a small block, which I put underneath the skull, which will allow the skull to sit at the proper angle. It doesn't matter if it's too visible, as I'll cover that up later. 
Now that the skull is positioned, I can disassemble the whole mount and sand it down. Once it's sanded, it's time to paint it, or if you want to stain it, you can do that too. Once the paint dries, simply reassemble your fence post and the dowels, and it's time to begin naturalizing your scene. For me, I went to Hobby Lobby and picked up some artificial plants. Use a hot glue gun to secure the plants in place. It works best if you use your girlfriend's hot pink glue gun. For my mount, I picked up vegetation and leaves that seemed like they were from fall and somewhat matched the terrain at my lease. Once the vegetation is glued in place, just use some twine or some wire to secure your euro in place on top of the post. Then simply place your mount wherever you'd like it to be displayed and show it off to your friends. All right guys, I hope you enjoyed that video and, and maybe you learned something or at least got some inspiration that you can use on your own Euro mounts. Um, and you know, for me at this point now, I'm just looking forward to the 2018 season, checking trail cameras, getting an inventory on my bucks and uh, trying to figure out how I'm going to uh, get after them this fall. And it should be a pretty good year. We're, we're having a very hot summer here in Texas. It's been uh, over 104, I think for like the last two weeks and we haven't had any rain. so. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the best for antler development, but I've still got some pretty good deer that I'm going to be chasing around this fall, I hope. So I'll be filming a hit list for you guys pretty soon, so stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, bow hunter die. You know, Justin, these are the kind of little tips that we bring here with bow hunter die that I think are fun. You know, this is Tyler in his home using the stuff that he's purchased, and it just goes to show, you know, you can do a lot. Sure. in the basement of your house to be able to have a really cool European mount. Yeah. I still am going to send all of my heads to Tyler Oaks. I really don't want to do the cleaning process. I'm going to let him do that part. <laughs> it's kind of girly to say that, but that's okay. No, it's not. I don't want to do that. Well, you killed the deer. You could at least clean the skull off. Well, that's I a know, big deal. I'm just being that. such a sissy. I'm so, busy. <laughs> But no, it, it's inspired me to at least think about doing my own. I have a couple skulls at home that are just kind of laying around that I thought, man, I should do something like that. He was I just, inspired. Let's I just, see if he follows I just need to find it. the time to do it now. Uh, so guys, next up, we're going to get two kind of summertime updates from myself as we check in on some of the food plot work I've been doing. And then we're going to visit with Tyler Rector. He actually is going to give us a great tip about uh, putting scrape trees out in your food plot. So let's watch those now. All right, guys, well, here we are, beginning of May. It is fourth season here for our turkey season. I'm back on the farm where I just shot my bird a couple weeks ago, but I am not turkey hunting. Today, I'm doing a little bit of food plot prep work. Uh, gotta be honest with you, uh, I wish I would have brought the moose boom sprayer today. Uh, I didn't think the weeds were gonna be all that bad being this early in the season, but this food plot is pretty much just full of grass right now. So I'm going to uh, spray it. I got about four gallons in the backpack sprayer. I think I can hit all of it and kill it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to broadcast right on top of it. We've got Heartland Wildlife, Clover, and Chicory that we are putting in here this year. So I'm going to get to work because it's getting late in the day and we got other plans. We're going to go try to roost some birds tonight and get the blind set up. We're hunting my buddy Dan's farm not too far away. Joey and I hopefully are going to uh, put a bird down tomorrow morning. So first order of business, boot plots. Let's do it. Dad, spray that white butterfly. <gasps> back at I keep getting my numbers mixed up this is technically food plot two I kept calling food plot three food plot two but this is food plot two this is the one I already planted this spring um, like I told you guys I came in here with a backpack sprayer killed all the weeds and just broadcast rack maker uh, plus in here and it looks amazing the alfalfa the chicory is looking awesome the clover's a little sparse in spots so I'm gonna go ahead and overseed this real quick with a bag of top seed trophy clover 
Uh, I'm gonna overseed it first and then I'm gonna mow everything. Uh, the point there being anything that I cut down will lay on top of that seed, uh, give it a little bit of cover, hold some moisture in, and hopefully we get a little bit more clover growing here. It's probably one thing I'd like to see more of, but I tell you the alfalfa and the chicory is looking phenomenal, like incredibly good, way, way better than I thought it was going to. So get a top seed first and then uh, go ahead and mow it. So let's get to it. What do you think, Joey? Having fun, dude? Yeah. Yeah, what are we doing? Mowing. Mowing, all right, let's do it. Well, it looks like the maiden voyage of the Swisher 44 inch rough cut mower was a success. Took me about 12 minutes to mow this plot. Probably would have been about half that if I uh, didn't have Joey riding down the ATV with me. Had to go slow for safety's sake, but everything is done. So clover seed is down, plots mowed, plenty of moisture in the ground. We got more rain coming this week, so this should be a killing plot this year. We just got to get a tree stand in it now. I think this is going to be the second location we're going to try to get a double ladder stand in. Maybe get the kids out here, try to whack a doe out of this plot early season, but it's a good rut spot as well. So that's about it for today, buddy. What do you think? Good. Did you have fun? Uh-huh. What do you want to do now? Uh, go look for deer. Let's go look for deer. I want to get a drink, and then maybe we'll go look for deer. So okay. all we got left to do is put up a couple trail cameras, pack up the trailer, and head home. So no. see you guys next time with an update on how the food plots are doing and how the bucks are growing. Or that baby. Well, good morning, everybody. It is late July here in Northern Illinois, and that means it is time to check cameras, look for some hitless bucks do some food plot work, do some tree stand work. It's a beautiful day out today, it is Sunday morning, and uh, we're doing some food plot maintenance first thing this morning. Uh, we're in a, a food plot here that is Rackmaker Plus, so that's gonna be a blend of alfalfa, clover, and chicory. Plot looks awesome, to be honest with you. Uh, I wasn't expecting a whole lot out of this plot. I came in here in the springtime, broadcast this whole plot back in, I think it was May, early part of May, I broadcast the seed, and then I just, ran through it and I killed it with a hand sprayer and some Roundup and let all that dead uh, foliage just fall on top of the seed and it actually came up, it looked amazing. Uh, this is my second mowing of the year. So I was here about a month ago and I mowed it, looked really good then. Had some weeds in it to be expected, but really not too bad. Uh, I overseeded it a month ago with another bag of uh, top seed trophy clover, really down at the other end of this plot. It was a little thin down there. Clover's coming up good. Uh, so this is the second mowing of the year. Like I said, it's late July. We'll probably do one more mowing uh, before the season starts. Probably sometime in late August or early September we'll give this one more mow and then that'll be it for the year. But i uh, got to tell you, the alfalfa is looking great. The chicory looks amazing. There's a lot of clover in here. Uh, really excited about this particular plot. I'm going to try to get a ground blind in here somewhere and uh, bring my little dude out here. Uh, hopefully early in the season, maybe try to shoot a doe out of this plot. So the mowing is done. I'm going to check a camera real quick. Had a bunch of pictures on it. Hopefully there's some, some nice bucks. And then we're going to get to disking the next food plot. So let's stop talking. Let's get to work. Well, guys, just uh, checked the card using the uh, little stealth cam radar here because I'm impatient like everybody else. And we've got a shooter on the farm. This is a deer that was here last year. He's got a broken knee on one side. I was calling him uh, Galuli or Jeff whichever you prefer. But uh, man, he was a real nice, I think he was a 10 point last year and I felt like he was a young deer. I knew if he stuck around, he was gonna be big and he's definitely big. I'd put him well into the 150s. Looks like he's a 10, maybe gonna be an 11 point. He's got a kicker coming off or a sticker coming off his base, maybe one off of his G2, but we'll show you the pictures of him. He's been here a lot this summer uh, with a couple other bucks. He's by far the biggest. Um, we know there were some other deer on this farm that made it through season that I did not see on this camera. But one thing I will tell you is the deer and the turkeys are absolutely hammering this plot. This card had over 3000 images on it in the last month. It was actually filled up. Thankfully it just filled up like, I don't know what today's date is. It filled up three days ago. Uh, so this is good timing that I got here when I did. 
um, mowed this thing down and we're gonna change this card out, probably put a bigger one in it. But the deer are absolutely pounding this alfalfa, clover, and chicory mix, which is a great sign. Hopefully we'll be able to shoot one off of this plot come fall. So let's get back to work. Playtime's over. Scent prevention doesn't start in the woods. It starts from square one and doesn't stop until your goal is reached. It's not an afterthought. It's a complete scent control system. For every season, for every species. Until your target is found. Dead down wind. All right guys, well we're at, we're at the farm here. We're gonna do a, a mock scrape, um, scrape tree. Basically, you know, a lot of people just put mock scrapes around the edges of the, the timber where, you know, that's that's great, but if you wanna really draw those, those big bucks out into the food plot um, during daylight hours, you gotta put it out in the middle. So what I'm gonna do today is I've got a couple steel posts. I'm gonna drive right here. I've got a tree stand and this tree right here, I got a lone, two lone wolves right here, probably 15 feet in the air, not very high, but uh, I got a clover food plot on the other side of this tree line that pinches them right down and underneath the stand, and then they have to come out in this food plot. But sometimes what they do is they skirt the edge of these woods, and I just can't get a, a good broadside shot. So um, this is where I missed Hoss, I don't know, two years ago I missed him out of this food plot. We've changed it up a little bit. It's gonna be a um, brassica and buck oak blend plot. Try to get them in a little bit closer. Normally I have about an acre here. I've cut the size down to probably about a quarter acre to really get them within that 30 yard range, hopefully. I'm gonna put this tree probably about right here where I'm standing. That's roughly, oh, probably 17, 18 yards away from the stand, so. Um, chip shot basically hopefully I don't miss it but um, anyway so we're gonna get get to working and uh, get these posts set go cut a branch down and go to work okay what I've done here is I've got these two T posts set I've got one with the spade facing me facing uh, this way and I got one facing the other way well a lot of times these bucks will do is I'll actually use it as a rubbing post too and if you don't put two two T posts, a lot of times they just bend one over or pull it out of the ground or whatever. I've also had pretty good luck using a wooden post. If you plan on having it there every year, just put it down in the ground, uh, just like a regular fence post. And uh, I'll even pour sackcrete around it so they can't not physically move that post. And then you just zip tie or wire your tree to that or your licking branch to that. Um, we're gonna go ahead and try to find an oak branch here or top of a tree that I can reach and get it cut to length and get it wired up. So I've got this tree that I always put a camera on and uh, it's usually pretty good because it always scrapes right here to my left along these woods. Um, my stand's right here. I'm gonna put this tree right here. This tree is perfect for a camera, but the problem is it's so little that in the wind, it uh, it blows a lot and I get a lot of pictures of nothing. So we're gonna take care of that today. And that's pretty, pretty secure. Ought to make it at least through deer, this deer season. I, I move them every year, just so they're not in my way when I do food plots and stuff. But uh, let's get some scent on this bad boy. Cover up mine, hopefully. Okay, next step here is find a branch that's roughly eye level with me. I'm six foot, so it's probably about five foot five or something like that. Five foot six, I don't know. But um, that seems about like the right height for these deer to put their nose up and really hit it good, a little over five feet. Um, normally, I would be wearing scent lock, rubber boots, rubber gloves when doing this, but um, since I just put this tree up, it's already new. 
these deer probably won't hit this right away and um even if they do it's august and i don't you know a lot of times these deer this time of year are used to people out and about doing stuff and this is really close to a house so they're kind of used to the human interaction what we're going to do here is i got this this power scrape from tinks scrape bomb fill it up to the line roughly two ounces right over there cap on it make sure it's good and tied good and what I'm going to do is I actually put this up above this branch this is the branch that I want it to, to be the licking branch it's on the opposite side of this tree from my tree stand therefore any deer co coming and going to the hit this branch unless they're walking all the way across this wide open field should offer me a broadside shot at some point so we're gonna tie that good. We're gonna leave that shut for now. I got this power scrape, um, the scrape starter from Tinks. I'm gonna go ahead and spray these posts, the tree, probably about every leaf on this thing that I could have touched um, with my hands and my scent. And then I'm gonna open that cap and then I'm gonna spray it again. I spray the ground, I spray everything. I'll even spray the bottom of my boots with it, which they're muddy. It shouldn't be a big deal, but um, I'm going to spray all this stuff that I could have touched with my scent. This will kind of cover it up. Kind of smells like ammonia um, when it breaks down. I, mean, I can smell it right now. It's pretty strong stuff. So. That's kind of what I do. Um, now come deer season, I, I won't put a camera on this probably today. It's just a lot of stuff going on that's new um, for this area. I have a camera back here on this culvert plot anyway, so I kind of know what's coming and going in this, into this food plot. Um, I'm actually going to probably, the way the dirt's looking, um, it's drying out pretty fast on top. Probably going to actually um, try to get the tractor and the seeder in here this afternoon maybe and seed this plot. And um, that'll work this dirt all over again anyway and just get rid of all the scent that I have or make it really spread out anyway. Um, probably going to come back in about a month let's say first of september and put a camera right over there um, it'll pick up any activity on this scrape tree it's roughly 10 yards probably so um yeah we're gonna pack everything up get out of here we've been doing a lot of stuff getting ready for deer season we've been uh fertilizing plots seeding plots um making sure tree stands are safe uh, putting all our lifelines out or i'm gonna start doing that i just got some new ones um, put all new lifelines out this year and um, hopefully hopefully find a big deer to hunt so probably be checking cameras here in a couple weeks and uh, getting a hit list together it's coming up fast hope you guys have good luck and um, hopefully this little tip will help you Justin, it's great to see you and Joey out there getting those food plots in. I like all of Joey's commentary. He's actually kind of just like his dad. You know, you see you out working, all of a sudden you hear him back there talking. I kind of like it to yeah, see him out there much. working with you. Good stuff. Yeah, but when I need to get real work done, then I have to leave him at home because chasing him around and watching everything he's doing or having him throwing mud at me while I'm trying to work and film just doesn't always work out. But, man, I tell you, that food plot is looking awesome. As you can see, it's getting eaten a lot by the local deer out there. I'm very, very happy with the way that's turned out. Yeah, and I, and I think the point that really needs to be discussed here is, I mean, Justin, I think that was a great video you put together showing people that, again, you don't need all the big tools. Guys, I mean, sometimes when I do my food plot segments here, I'm lucky enough to have a tractor. Sure. Here you're showing a four-wheeler, a small mower, I mean, yeah. broadcasting your seed in, and you can have a killer plot and i'll tell you right now there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to kill a deer over that plot. yeah i mean that spot right there has been a food plot for a couple of years this is the first year that's in the the clover alfalfa chicory mix it's doing awesome uh we wanted to give the brassicas a break for a couple of years because you you're really to. not supposed to plant those year in and year out so we went with something different this year you know i tried it kind of as an experiment in the spring obviously it's worked out well for us and those are two different heartland 
bags that you used? Uh, well, I first used the uh, Rack Maker Plus, which okay. is the alfalfa, clover, and chicory. Then I went back later and I did overseed it with some additional clover gotcha. and some of the bare spots. Um, so there's a good mix of stuff in there, hoping for some you know early season success in that spot. Uh, and then you know Tyler's you know segment was great as well. You know that's something I've wanted to do yeah. for years. I'm doing it. I, after well, I have to admit, I mean. That inspired me a lot more. <laughs> that inspired me a lot more than going and spraying the spraying the buck's head with all the brains in it, for sure. Fair so I, I, that there, Tyler, that was a great segment. I mean, I am 100% game. I, mean, I already got it in my brain when I'm well, gonna go where, pick up my. Two where posts. I think it comes in the most handy is for the guys that have bigger food plots, yes. where those deer get out into them and then you can't shoot them. Um, I think that gives them a reason to visit a yeah. specific spot in the plot, hopefully puts them within bow range. And obviously, as you guys saw, it's relatively easy to do. Uh, so guys, the last segment we're going to have for this show is actually going to be Matt Miller and Tim Ainsworth. They're doing some uh, off-season bow preparation yeah. and some bow tuning. They've got some great tips for us, so let's check those out now. Hey guys, July 28th, Troy and I came over to Matt's house to shoot our bows and while we were here we wanted to take advantage of some of his expertise. Um, you know, we've all been busy with the kids going on vacations and work and it's been hard for us to be out there shooting. So we wanted to make sure our bows were properly tuned, that we're shooting well, and so we came over to hang out with Matt and have a good time. Matt's got a little process he goes through before each season and uh, Matt, why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, um, I basically have an eight step process that I learned a number of years ago when I was working in a pro shop. And it's what I do soup to nuts, start from, you know, start to finish with a brand new hunting bow. We're gonna walk you guys through every single one of those steps today and explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if you guys can replicate that process at home with some of the simple tools we'll show you today, I guarantee your hunting bows are gonna be perfectly dialed in. So we're gonna head to the man cave, let's go do it. All right guys, so uh, we've got Tim's brand new Triax here in the bow vise and we're gonna take you through the very first step. And um, basically I call the first step on this one uh, rough specs. And you know, there's essentially a starting point that you wanna start at with a couple of the different things on a Matthews. And pretty much all Matthews bows, you're gonna start with these exact specs. Um, the first of which is gonna be your center shot. So when you take an arrow and you put it on and you load it, it's basically the distance from the center of that shaft to the inside of the riser. And Matthews is almost always gonna recommend that we start at 13 sixteenths of an inch off the inside of the riser. And uh, looking at this right now, it is just about where it needs to be, so we're gonna let it go ahead and stay there. Um, the second thing that we're gonna look at as a rough spec is I generally will like to start just about an eighth of an inch knock high with your knocking point. So the way that we do that is with a bow square, and you want the bottom of that bow square to be roughly w right about where the center of the shaft is gonna be on the rest. We're actually in a pretty good starting point right now. We're gonna, we're gonna finish up the rough specs component step here. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna retie in the loop and the knock points on here. And um, one of the things I like to do when I'm doing this is I'll always use two tight end knock points and I do that for a specific reason. Um, what I found is if I ever have to replace the loop material down the road, my knock point will stay in the same exact spot if I have two knock points on there. The other thing that I like to do is I like to always use the actual knock that somebody's going to be shooting. So I've got one of Tim's actual Luminox here, and uh, we'll use that to make sure that we get the correct spacing on these knock points so that we don't get knock pinch, which can sometimes cause that arrow to come up and off the rest if, if it's not spaced appropriately. So you'll see guys, when I'm tying these in, I just tie in with a simple over under knot. Once I get the first one in, I'll pull the square out because I don't need it anymore. One of the key things that I do when I tie my knock points as well is on the bottom side of the knock, I'll always tie that knock point to be roughly twice as long as the top one. And what that will do is it'll pull your release into alignment so it's directly behind the arrow. Last thing I'm gonna do, I did a double overhand knot on the bottom of it. I'll go ahead and use my lighter to burn that down. Be careful not to burn the string. The bow will come apart if you do that. And again, we're gonna use that Luminoc that Tim's gonna use this year, just so that we make sure that we get the appropriate spacing. And you guys wanna err on the side of making sure that there's enough room in here. A lot of guys think that this needs to be a super tight, snug fit, and you just don't. You can see, if you look in here, 
there should be enough room to be able to wiggle that up and down because what will happen is when this bow comes back to full draw this will actually be on an angle right here and if you don't leave yourself just a little bit of wiggle room it'll cause that knock pinch and it'll actually cause the arrow to come up and off the rest on you at full draw kind of the last step on the rough specs that we're going to we're going to work on here is getting this loop on so working with a piece of pine ridges loop material um, tim likes yellow as you can see so that's what we're rolling with today first thing i do is you take the cut end and you're going to mash that down with your finger just like that and if you look you'll see it's kind of all out like a flower and uh, what you'll do then is you'll start to burn that down and you want to make sure you're just holding it close to the heat you don't want it to actually catch on fire because it can get a little bit brittle and could potentially pop the knot on you just throwing the loop on just like this you'll go ahead and loop this up and around and you'll see when you do that it'll start to cinch right down on itself and then everybody does this a little differently the way that I tend to tie mine I like the knot on one side on the top to be on one side and then I'll actually pull it on the opposite side of the string to do the bottom knot and before I cinch this down for the bottom I'm gonna go ahead and trim this and eyeball it and we'll do the same process then we'll flare that out on the top burn it down into a nice little ball We'll let that uh, set and get good and hard before we tie it. But uh, I'll give it a little tweak with the needle nose pliers just to seat it. And we'll button that up when we get done later with a peep sight. All right guys, one of the next steps that I'm gonna do just to make sure that our rough specs are correct in the bow is we're gonna check the spine on the arrow. And I use an application called Software for Archers. It's made by a company called On Target 2. Um, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to put in all the specs for Tim's bow and then we're also going to put in the specs for Tim's zombie slayer that he's planning on shooting this year. Alright guys, so we just got done running everything through on target too. What we found is Tim's bow, if it's bottomed out, most of these Matthews are going to be between 70 and 71 pounds. Um, it's going to probably just be on a hair on the weak spine side. So what we're going to do is when we get it done in its final state of tune, we're going to drop it back to about 68 pounds and it should be absolutely perfect right in the sweet spot for the spine. All right guys, so we got the paper tuner set up. So the next step, Tim's gonna shoot one of these through. You can see if you're looking down range here, we're probably three or four yards away from the paper tuner. And uh, I do it from that distance. It gives it just a little bit of distance for the arrow to come off the bow and kind of straighten out. Um, but if you give it too much distance, you'll give the fletchings too much of an opportunity to correct any bad flight that might be happening. So you'll get a much better picture of what's really happening at just about three to four yards. It's pretty close. <laughs> All right guys, based on the first arrow, it's just a little bit knock left and low. We're going to basically do two fine adjustments on the bow to get that dialed back in. So do you follow the tear or do you go opposite the tear? How does that work? Yep. So basically with it being uh, knock low and left, what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to drop the rest to just a little hair. Okay. So probably like a sixteenth of an inch. All right. So we made that small rest adjustment to clean the up, uh, the up and down tear variation that we had. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a small top hat adjustment. So Matthews has a system on their cross-centric can system. Essentially, they call them top hats, but it's kind of a little bushing if you look. Now what we need to do, because we had this thing as a knock left tear, is we're gonna shim the cam in the direction of wherever the knock end of the arrow was tearing. So we're gonna shim these cams just a little bit left in order to clean that up. And essentially what that's going to do is it will move the path of the string directly into alignment with where the center shot is at 13 16 of an inch on the rest. We've got the bow pressed down. Um, we're gonna pull the string and the cables off of this thing quick. And then I'm gonna basically let all the tension off of the limbs on this bow. And once we have it completely let down, we'll throw it back into the vise. Um, once we've got it there, I can actually back out the axles. We'll pull the cams off of the bow and that's when we'll be able to pop those top hats out and put the appropriate uh, width top hats in. 
Hopefully we get it the first time and we get the right width in there, but it's kind of a trial and error thing. So I'll take a guess on the first one. We'll shoot it through paper and we'll see what happens with it. So we're going to go ahead and get after it and get it done now. All right, guys, so we just got everything buttoned back up. We're going to pull it out of the press, head back into the range and see if we can shoot another one. Um, we'll see. Maybe we clean that tear up from that top hat adjustment. Um, we only adjusted the top cam from what I could see. The bottom cam was already shimmed pretty far left. The top cam was not though out of the box. So we adjusted that to reflect what we were seeing on the bottom. And um, we're gonna go shoot it and see what happens. All right guys, that second tear was pretty good. All right guys, so the next step, we're gonna get this thing on the draw board, which is this contraption that I've built on the side of the bench here. And uh, if you actually look online, uh, Last Chance Archery um, through Lancaster Archery sells a couple of really nice uh, draw boards that go right into the end of their press. I don't have one, I kind of old school. I've got one built out of a boat winch. It works really well though for what I need it for. Um, so we're gonna throw this thing on there and essentially what we're gonna do is just double check the cam timing. All right guys, so we just got it cranked back on the draw board. Um, I don't know how it happened to work out this way, but it was absolutely perfect the very, very first shot, perfectly in time. Both the top and the bottom stops were hitting and contacting the cable at pretty much the exact same time, which is what you want. That's ideal. Everything in theory should be pretty good, but we're going to head outside and validate all of it now on paper. So now this is kind of where the rubber starts to meet the road. We're going to come out here. We're going to shoot both a fletched shaft and a bare shaft at 20 yards and see where they impact. And hopefully with any luck and if Tim makes two good shots, <laughs> they'll hit the same exact spot. So let's see what happens. Looks good. Looks good. I think we're done guys. We're ready to fling some arrows. Let's get these both sighted in and uh, we're gonna have a little fun so thanks for doing going through that with us man I really appreciate it you know guys you can learn about all this stuff on the internet it's nice to have a mentor like we do with Matt um, again feeling confident out in the field when that moment comes is gonna make a huge difference until guys, next time yeah until next time thanks for watching guys bow hunter die well guys that was a great segment from uh, Matt and Tim there you know it definitely helps when you've got a friend or maybe somebody at a local pro shop that's willing to kind of walk definitely. you through some of these steps so you understand them. There is kind of a steep learning curve there, and I know it can be intimidating uh, to do some of that stuff, especially when you start looking at pressing a bow, taking the cams out of it. Obviously, guys, if you do not feel comfortable doing that stuff, go to your local pro yeah. shop, find a good person, you know, locally that can help you out and do that. But if you want to do it yourself, great tips. Uh, it's always nice to be able to wrench on your own gear, you know, in your garage, and then be able to go out in the backyard and, and fling a few arrows. Uh, Todd. What else do we got coming up? It is you're almost, you were almost out of breath there. I was then? almost out of breath. Too much talking. <laughs> what, well, is, what is coming up? Lots of great stuff. I mean, you know, number one, the hunting season. But beyond the hunting season, we got the uh, Lancaster Extravaganza. We're going to be out there for sure. Uh, not, not me and we. Justin, but, you know, we as bowhunting.com and Bowhunter Die, both Scott Sanderson and... I think Frank's going to be joining him as well. So the so. two of our guys are going to be out there. Make sure you stop by and see him. The first 20 guys that stop by and see him, we're going to give them uh, and mention, or die hats. And they got to mention the show. So right, it's August 17th and 18th at the Lancaster Archery headquarters out there in Pennsylvania. If you guys show up, first 20 people to mention Bowhunter Die at our booth are going to get free hats. So make sure you guys stop in, say hello. They've got some awesome deals going on. And, uh, and it's pretty busy, guys. I, mean, I don't know how huge of a booth they're going to have. I mean, I know they got just a small little table thing. So seek them out, Scott and Frank, and they'll take care of you. Okay, cool. Other than that, we've got a lot of the Western seasons are getting ready to open up. I mean, we're literally a week away from antelope opening wow. in uh, Wyoming. And then, you know, September's right around the corner. So we got a lot of elk seasons that are going to start opening up. Uh, guys, I know there's a lot of people getting ready to go on elk hunts. Some of our guys are getting ready to go as well. Josh Fletcher's put together an awesome segment for everybody. If you're doing like a backcountry type of pack-in hunt for food preparation before your hunt, very important thing. So granola guys, bars, is that all you need? Yeah, just granola bars and, and water <laughs> out of a stream, right? No, guys, go to bowhunting.com, look it up. There's a whole video that Josh put together on what he's preparing, how he's preparing it, how he's sealing it. He's going to pack it in for his upcoming elk hunt in Idaho. So guys, definitely make sure you check that out. Uh, of course, we don't want to forget the folks that sent in their trophy photos for this week's episode. Uh, we've got some more great Pine Ridge archery gear to give away. So let's take a look at those entries now. 
Andrew Finch, JJ Karak, John Leitzel, Justin Moore, Logan Traffy, and Nick Nispel. Hey guys, those are some great trophies. And listen, before we throw out the winner here, guys, these are the things that we're looking for. I mean, I, you know, Justin, let's just elaborate here a little bit, you know, because okay. we're starting to catch some heat from time to time. Guys, we don't want to see blue jeans. We want to see your bow and arrows. We mean, be, man, be proud yeah, of being so a bow no, hunter. No bow in the photo. You're kind of DQ'd yep. automatically because we don't know if you shot it with a bow. No blue, blue jeans. No blue jeans. Come on. No, not a fan. We went with the smiling, too. We want you to smile. You got to be happy. Guys. You just shot something. I would be happy. I'm happy. Don't, don't mean rug right. in your photo. This isn't like a hardcore like high school football team photo. Like, you want to be happy. All right, enough of that. We are getting more picky around here. So, guys, when you're sending in your trophy photos, come on. We got some great prize packs attached to these. So, make sure your photo is in the best condition it can be in. Logan, you're the winner of the Pine Ridge Prize Pack this week. Make sure you email us your information in, and we will get you your pack sent out to you. Congratulations. That was a great black bear. Yes, definitely. Make sure you send that to info at bowhunting.com. Logan Traffy, if I said that right, you are our winner for this week. So, guys, that is it for this episode of Bowhunter Die. I'm actually going to miss the next episode. I'll be in Wyoming. So you're going to have to find a fill-in for me. No problem. We got it. Who's it going to be? My replacement. I don't know, man. I get all kinds of people. Don't worry. <laughs> Hopefully it's not permanent, but you just never know. I'm going to come back, and there'll be a new Justin in the studio. We're not going to get rid of you. But I will be in Wyoming with Neil and with Matt I think Miller. he's just telling me that right now just to prep me for the fact that he's going to be gone. I mean, it's just kind of like a reminder. Like it is on, he, it, it it is on the, calendar. the calendar. Yeah, no, it's not. we got to get that fixed. But My hopefully we will working. be shooting or have shot some Wyoming antelope by this time in two weeks. So, guys, thanks again for tuning in. We'll be back in two weeks with another great episode. Bow hunter die. For more exciting action, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and receive live updates from our team members as well as the latest happenings in the bow hunting and archery world. Be sure to share your photos, stories, and experiences as well. And don't forget to pick up your official bowhunting.com and bowhunter die gear by visiting bowhunting.com forward slash gear. We have a full selection of hats, shirts, decals, wristbands, and much more. We're gonna head into the man cave here in just a minute and uh, we'll show you guys what we do. Thank you. Blech. YouTube intro, I'm rolling. What are we talking about? Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Bowhunter Die. Now that Justin has all of his weightlifting maneuvers finished, we can finally get serious. Brandon said we gotta episode. do pumps so our arms look big during well, the show. We're not, we're not gonna be able to do the high in the rest of the crew. All right. Well, that was definitely great to see Tyler finally oh, finish it. Yeah, do mom. show intro, man. Oh, whoa. Show, we gotta do whoa, show whoa, intro. Whoa, I, hey, forgot, I forgot. Hey, I forgot. everybody! Hey, everybody! Um.